There we go. Okay. I'll probably forget to record it at some point during the term, but I'll blame you guys. You guys could have told me the rec button isn't on. So if, you, if I'm talking and there's no rec button, then let me know. Okay, uh, so we talked about what's a sample versus what's a population. And we kind of went on and on about, okay, we have to have a sample and that's where we're gonna get our information from. But then the whole goal is to be able to say something about the population, right? And then we talked about uh, notation for sample versus population information. Things like X bar is the sample mean, whereas mu is the population mean, et cetera. That's from last thing. So, all term, right, we'll be talking about data and data sets. So we need to be able to talk about data sets, right, data and data sets, uh, and their components kind of with terms, common terms. Okay, so uh, if you think about data, you're probably thinking a spreadsheet, right? So uh, if you look at the columns, right, the up and down the columns, and so those would be variables, right? So each column in a spreadsheet is a variable, right? Each row in a spreadsheet is going to be uh, just a subject or whatever person um, that you've collected information from. Okay. So we need to be able to to talk about data sets. So we're going to start kind of, or keep developing our terminology, I guess. So usually data is stored in a spreadsheet of some sort. Usually data is stored in a spreadsheet. And each column represents a variable. So when I say variable, I want you to think, okay, well, that's a column in a spreadsheet, right? And it makes sense that it would be called the variable, right? Because for each individual that we're sampling or getting information from, the answer is gonna vary slightly, right? How tall are you, right? We've got all these varying responses, hence it's a variable, right? And each, each row represents a subject, right? Or a person, if you prefer. We don't always just talk about people, right? So in general, we call them subjects. Or observations. But we'll call them subjects or simpler terms, just each person gets its own row. Okay. So I like manatees. And so, yeah, you'll see a lot of manatees. Um, so we've got, let's make up a quick fake data set. So first observation is manatee number one. Manatee number two, manatee number three, et cetera. Right. So we're just making up a fake data set. 
can we record their weight, their length, their gender, and their species? All seems pretty reasonable. And you've collected these manatees and you do all these measurements and you record them and then you store them in a spreadsheet. Ta-da, you've got a data set. Congratulations. Okay. So let's say uh, the weight in kilos and the length in meters. Now, I made this up a long time ago and I, I don't even know if these numbers are reasonable, but we'll just go with it. Whatever, it doesn't matter. 315, it's a lot. 450, 298 for the weights. For the length, manatee number one is 1.5 meters. It's not actually that long, but that's okay. Uh, 2.1 meters, 1.7 meters. And the first one is female, second one's male, and the second one or third one's female, etc. Making it up. For the species, manatee number one happens to be a West Indian manatee, whereas manatee number two and three are Amazonian manatees. It doesn't matter. So here in our data set, we have four variables. Weight, length, gender, and species. Just by looking at these, we can tell that there's a difference between these variables and these variables, right? These ones are just categories, right? Male, female, put into either slot, right? Species, no matter how many species you have, there's a finite amount. And so each manatee, you just look and say, oh, this is a West Indian manatee, goes in this category. This is an Amazonian manatee, goes in this category, right? And so, these variables, right, where we have these categories, we'll call categorical data. It's reasonable enough. Right? Here, for things like weight and length and distance and speed and money, well, the list goes on and on and on, right, we've got measurements. And so those we'll have to treat differently from categorical variables, right? So at the very highest level, we've got variables. And each of these variables can be separated into either categorical variables or numerical variables. Okay. Numerical being any measurement. Okay. So, variables can be split into, ironically, two categories. Categorical and numerical. Oops. Problem with stats is that it's used in every field. I guess that's a good thing. But um, in that, every field kind of has its own preferred terminology. And for this kind of introductory course, it's my job to introduce you to all this terminology and get you to link it up and say, oh, that's all the same. So in the beginning, it feels like it's 
it's a lot of terms for the same thing. So a categorical variable can also be called a qualitative variable, right? I'll use categorical and numerical, but now that I've told you, you should link categorical to qualitative, right? Qualitative meaning it has some quality. So categorical can also be called qualitative and numerical can also be called quantitative. So having some quantity. Right? But like I said, I'll stick to categorical and numerical. So categorical, or let's stop and just kind of make a little tree here. So we've got a variable. So all columns in a spreadsheet are variables. And then we're going to split it up to be either categorical or numerical. Categorical is any data that can be grouped into categories, right, or is grouped into categories. So data that is grouped into categories. Whereas a numerical variable is just any measured value. Okay. So any measured value. Okay. And that's kind of vague, yeah. Um, sort of, but you would have variables in your sample, but yeah. So um, numerical is kind of tricky to get kind of a, a pulse on, right? It's just any measured value. Uh, it is kind of the most common one. And one thing that I like to ask myself is, does it make sense to talk about the average of this thing, right? If it makes sense to talk about the average of something, then it's numerical. Okay. Average age, average spending, average speed, average um, length, average weight, right? And so if it makes sense, if it makes sense to talk about the average of a variable, to talk about the average of a variable, it is numerical. So the reason you're probably collecting data or looking at data and have to identify whether things are numerical or categorical is probably because you have some research question in mind, right? Uh, what is the average uh, weight of manatees, for example? Right, so we've collected this data set, including the weight, but also with these other variables, right? And so our research question is about the weight. So that's what we would call our response variable or our dependent variable, another kind of dual term, right? Um, so our response variable is going to be the variable in our research question, right? All these other variables we've collected because, well, we may as well, but also because we're hoping that they might help explain changes in the response variable. 
making these explanatory variables or independent variables. Right? So we've got a research question. In our research question, we're talking about our response variable. Right? So we'll have one response variable. Everything else will be an explanatory variable because we're hoping that they're going to help explain changes in the response variable. Okay. So a lot of ins and outs here. Okay. So uh, given a research question, uh, I'll just say, for example, what is the average weight? is the average weight of manatees just as an example the variable we're interested in is our response variable the variable we are interested in is our response variable. Okay. Which means that in our case, right, weight is both numerical as well as our response variable. You can have ex um, response variables that are categorical, can have response variables that are numerical, right? They'll be one or the other, right? Uh, and then the rest of them are just explanatory variables. Okay. All other variables are explanatory variables. I'll just make a note here. Response variable, oops, can also be called or be referred to as the dependent variable. explanatory variables can also be referred to as independent variables. So in our case, if we just have a look at our data set, we have weight, we have length, we have gender, and we have species. Weight, right, would be a numerical response variable. Right? Assuming this, our research question is, uh, what's the average weight of manatees? And so this would be our numerical response variable. Whereas length would be a numerical explanatory variable. gender and species, right? They're both categorical and they're both explanatory variables. Right? So uh, 
categorical. I'll get lazy. X bar. Even lazier, cat X bar. I don't know if I can get any lazier than that. CEV. <laughs> Something gets lost in that CEV. Okay. So all our variables can be classified as either numerical or categorical, and then they can be classified as either response or explanatory variable. Right? So we'll only have one response variable. Everything else is an explanatory variable. Okay. On test one, what I'll do is I'll give you a, a very kind of similar layout, right? And some of the questions, just kind of quick multiple choices. Uh, the length variable is, uh, and then you pick whichever option is right, right? That kind of thing. So uh, it is something that I'm expecting you to do, but should be easy marks. Okay. So uh, we don't deal with scatter plots until. Uh, later in the term, but in terms of a scatter plot, scatter plot is just the normal kind of x, y axis, and dots everywhere. So right, here we've got just the scatter plot which we're not gonna go into, but in terms of the scatter plot, uh, the explanatory variable goes on the x-axis, and that's why I like that terminology because explanatory goes on the x-axis, right? Whereas uh, dependent, independent doesn't have that same kind of ring to it. And so the response variable is on the y-axis. That's not going to crop up until later, but it's good to kind of keep that in mind. I guess I didn't define, let's talk about what an explanatory variable is. I said it, but I didn't write it down. So an explanatory variable is any variable in the data set here's kind of a sneaky thing that isn't the response variable that isn't the response variable. And then we collect these explanatory variables, right? One, because we've, we've got these people doing our survey, for example, or we've got this manatee, so we may as well collect more information on it, right? Um, but also because we hope that maybe it'll help explain changes in our response variable. Okay. So we collect explanatory variables. With the hope that they will help explain changes in the response variable. Okay. So this is gonna be important, right? Being able to, well, first formulate a, a research question so we can identify our response variable but also once we have our data set, right, uh, how we proceed 
depends on if we have a categorical variable right, or a numerical variable. We've already seen one example, right? It only talks, uh, or it only makes sense to talk about the average of a numerical variable, right? So I would hate for you to go out there and try to talk about the average of a category. It doesn't really make sense, right? And so, right, what we'll find throughout this whole term is that first we focus on numerical variables, then we switch to categorical variables, right? But we'll do the same things, right? We'll visualize them, we'll summarize them, visualize them, summarize them. And then uh, we move on to analyzing variables, right? So then we analyze numerical data, we analyze categorical data, right? But it all kind of branches at, is it numerical or is it categorical, right? So all our analyses kind of hinge on what type of variable we have. Right? So all our analyses depend on whether we have oops, a numerical or categorical variable. Any questions before we get into data collection, sampling, surveys, all that fun stuff? It's not that fun. Just got to plow through it. No questions? Comments? Concerns? All right. So uh, 1.3 is just a quick note on data collection. actually very similar to 1.4 which is on sampling. Sampling often refers to surveys, right? Data collection being just whenever you have to collect any sort of data. Okay. So one thing to keep in mind if you have to or if you feel like you have to collect data is there's been a lot of data collected already so you probably don't, right? Uh, you can find a lot of data online especially, you know, if it's kind of globally related, right? Animals, people, whatever. Uh, if it's college specific, then maybe not. But, uh, but a lot of data is available already, right? And so just keep that in mind because data collection can be expensive, can be difficult, right? Um, and at the very least, it's difficult to design a data collection strategy that actually works, right? So I guess what I'm saying is if you can avoid it, avoid it. Don't collect data. So a lot of data has already been collected. what you'll see in the lab. Um, there are some data sets that are built into R that we'll use um, and there's tons and tons of them. So, and they're just kind of fun. And can be found online. Okay. So, if you do have to collect your own data, then as far as we'll go in this course is to say that you have to make sure that you have a random sample, right? So your sample has to be randomly selected in order for your sample to be representative of your population, right? That's the only way that we'll be able to take information from our sample to say something about the population, right? And so if you have to collect, if you have to collect your own data, 
you need to make sure your sample is randomly selected. It's so distracting because it sounds like Paul's on the other side. I don't know though. Is it Paul? It might be the echo. I'm not too sure. <laughs> oh no, I can hear him. Anyways. Um, we'll have to hunt him down. So, what is randomly selected by definition, you ask? Well, I thought you'd never ask. Randomly selected. By definition, okay, means that each individual right, has the same probability of being selected into the sample. Right? And so if there are people that you can't reach by your survey methods, then your sample is not random. Right? That's a problem because each individual right, in the population that you're trying to reach has to have the same probability of being selected in this sample. Okay? So that's randomly selected. So each individual in the population has the same probability oops has the same probability of being selected into the sample. So that's just random by definition. So right, in order for our sample to be representative of the population, right, for us to draw any conclusions or reliable conclusions, I should say, right, we have to have a random sample. So in order for our sample to be representative of the population. Of course, our sample must be randomly selected. So I, um, I fly a lot because my husband lives in Ottawa. And so, uh, it's kind of complicated. But anyway, so I fly a lot. And I think it's so funny because every time the thing beeps, everyone always says, oh, sure, randomly selected. It's like, it was randomly selecting you. It just selects a lot of people. <laughs> <laughs> so I, do, I think it's so funny because everyone's like, oh, sure, I'm always randomly selected. Like, yeah, well, it was random, probably. I'm assuming, but why wouldn't it be? Right. So, anyways, um, yeah. as far as data collection goes, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about surveys. Surveys are kind of their own beast, but uh, data collection in general, people do their PhDs in this field, so it's like a huge field. It's not something that we can cover or even pretend to cover in this course, right? So that's why I kind of keep it brief and just say, make sure you have a random sample and maybe ask someone who knows what they're doing for help. That's all the advice I can offer you. Okay. Same thing for uh, 
which is on sampling. So 1.4 is on sampling. Sampling sounds the same as data collection, right? You're collecting data or you're sampling kind of information. Uh, sampling often refers to surveys. It just kind of specifies uh, surveys. So sampling. <laughs> Uh, that was a mess. Uh, often refers to surveys. We've all done surveys, probably not made surveys. It's really kind of difficult. And again, Survey design is another field that kind of gets a lot of attention because it is how we get a lot of information, right? So again, it's not something that I would recommend that you do on your own, right? Uh, but you'll probably come across a survey or two in your lifetime. I'm just guessing. Um, so we'll just talk kind of, kind of briefly about surveys. Um, Surveys are different in that the sample that we'll talk about right, is the original mail out. How many people did you try to contact? I'm assuming we all have kind of a good idea of what a survey is. Um, I say mail out because I guess I'm old school. Uh, I used to work at a market research firm and we just called it mail out, even if it was like an email blast or like phones or whatever. Uh, so the original mail out is just all the people that you tried to contact in the population, right? And so that's what we call our sample, right? Which is kind of weird because usually our sample is all the information that we have, right? But when we're talking surveys, all the information that we get back, right? We know we don't always get all those surveys back, right? And so those ones that we do get back, we call responses, right? So for surveys, a sample is the original mail out. Whereas the responses are the actual surveys completed. It's kind of different from our usual data sets. We just call that our sample. Um, the reason I want to talk about that is because the most important thing if you're reporting on survey data is that you have to include your uh, response rate, right? How many responses did you get back out of how many did you try to mail out, right? How many people did you try to contact? And then how many did you get back, right? That's your response rate. And you want a high response rate, right? Uh, because that means that your results are more reliable. Then if you have a low response rate, then you're saying, well, I tried to contact, you know, 10,000 people and I only heard back from 200. It happens, right? So that's a pretty low response rate. Whereas if you tried to contact 250 people and you heard back from the same 200 again, <laughs> that's a way better response rate and way more reliable results than the 200 where you tried to reach 10,000. Right. Kind of complicated. But anyways, the response rate. Is the number of responses over the number in the sample. So if you're reading survey results, it's also important for you to have a look at the response rate, right? If the response rate was low, then you can't, right? These conclusions don't carry as much weight as they would if you have a high response rate. 
And so it's important, or it is important, to report the response rate since 200 out of 250 is a great response rate. While 200 out of, let's say, 10,000 is a terrible response rate. We need a reasonably high response rate. So we need a reasonably high I'll put in brackets, so around, and this isn't gonna sound high at all, right? So 10, 20%, 20% would actually be really good, uh, but surveys are really hard to get back. Okay, so 10%, uh, I've had to crank out reports with a 2% response rate with all these kind of caveats please note the response rate is really low and therefore my conclusions are not that reliable. Blah, 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 blah. please, like, basically, please don't spend any money on these conclusions uh, because we don't have enough information, right? Uh, you still report it, but you do have to include and say, hey, these results are actually not that reliable because we would need to collect more information, right? And so around 10%, is kind of what you're aiming for, bless you. Um, and that would be a reasonably high response rate. Each field has its own kind of benchmark, right? but 10, I'd say, okay, fine. Um, anything less than that's a little bit. Okay. So we need a reasonably high response rate Uh, in order to reliably draw conclusions from our data. you later. Okay, so um, good sampling versus bad sampling. So how are we supposed to collect all these surveys? Um, as you can imagine, it's really very difficult, right? To even start off and you, you now know you're supposed to have a random sample, meaning everyone in the population has the same probability of being selected. That's already feeling very difficult, right, for a survey. If there's gonna be people that you can't reach or um, just they won't respond, right, that kind of thing. And so um, we'll start by talking about bad sampling. So what are some bad sampling things to keep an eye out for? Uh, the problem with surveys is, uh, all these bad sampling things are always gonna be there. It's our job to just minimize it, right? Try to get it to be as good of a sample as possible. Okay, so bad sampling. Is basically any sampling that is biased. Any sampling that is biased. What's bias? Bias, by definition, is when we systematically favor one outcome, right? One or more outcomes. 
but not all of them in, or um, uniformly. So it's systematically favoring one outcome So some examples, if you think about voluntary responses, right, so Facebook kind of just puts out a survey to everyone with the Facebook page and whoever wants to answer it, answers it, whoever doesn't, doesn't, right? they don't care, that's a voluntary response, or right? you're just putting it out to the masses whatever information you get back is gravy, right? That's a voluntary response and that's bias, right? We're trying to reduce bias, but um, I mean, if you're putting out a voluntary survey, then you know what you're dealing with, right? All your results will be voluntary, right? And so uh, another thing to kind of keep an eye out for would be uh, convenience samples. Let's say you're just kind of, you're collecting data here at the college and you just stand down here in the atrium and you're just collecting information from people as they pass by, right? That's not random sampling, right? Well, it's a convenient sample. You're just standing in one spot and as people come to you, you pick them and they might answer, they might not, right? but you're missing out on all the people who, well, didn't come to the atrium that day. Right. And so that would be convenient for you, but not so good for our sample. Right. And so, uh, like I said, and I'll say it again, because it's important to keep in mind, so samples or surveys specifically are tricky, right? All of these things will be there to some degree. We just try to minimize them, right? Myself, for example, I am a sucker for surveys, so I always do surveys, very time consuming. Um, but I always, if you know, the school puts one out or whatever, uh, then I'll always do it just because I've been waiting for survey responses. Like, oh, can I just have three more? That kind of thing, which in itself is ironically bias because I always do surveys. So you just can't win. Let's just quickly talk about some other things to avoid slash be aware of okay, with surveys. So some other things, oops. To avoid <laughs> slash just be aware of with surveys things like under coverage and we'll just talk about these huge deal so under coverage when tried to reach people in a certain region, let's say, so we're talking about BC, right? And um, you just put out a survey to all of BC and you do your mail out, right? phone, whatever. Um, and you just can't get enough responses from the North, from it, for example, right? Not very many people live in the North or the area of BC, right? And so, the number of responses that you get from the lower mainland, for example, they'll just kind of uh, dwarf anything that you get from the north, right? So under coverage is pretty common and I'll show you a few ways that you can kind of get around those things, uh, but under coverage, non-response is another thing. So non-response being you tried to contact these people and they just didn't respond. Oh, shucks. 
response bias. Okay. If I say, I am from the Dean's office, how do you like your program? You're probably gonna say, oh, I love it, or something like that, right? So uh, there you'll have some response bias. And so uh, just things like that, or even wording of questions or question order can have an impact. Okay, so wording of questions or even question order. These can all have an effect on the responses. Right. And I've got kind of a, well, it's not fun, but an interesting uh, little blurb. And I'll just swish it over here. We can read it. You don't have to copy it out at all. It's really not that important. Uh, it's just kind of to prove my point. So all these old slides I stole from an American textbook and I haven't, uh, there's probably typos in there. So how do Americans feel about illegal immigrants? So the question was, should illegal immigrants be prosecuted and deported for being in the US illegally or shouldn't they? Kind of an open-ended question. Ask this question in an opinion poll, 69% favored deportation. But when the very same sample, so these are the same people, um, was asked whether illegal immigrants who have worked in the US for two years should be given a chance to keep their jobs and eventually apply for legal status. 62% said that, oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, of course. So you've got the same people. There's some overlap in there, right? 69%, 62%, right? So something's going on there. Yeah. And same thing, so what about government help for the poor? Only 13% think we're spending too much on assistance to the poor, uh, but 44% think that we're spending too much on welfare. So just little word choices, right? Things like that can have a huge impact on the responses that you're getting, right? So what are we supposed to do? Surveys all seem to be garbage. Yeah, they basically are. But it's all we can do, right? And so let's just talk briefly about some good sampling, right? What can we do to try to minimize all this, um, all these issues that we've just discussed? So good sampling. you probably guessed it, is a randomly selected sample. Right. So easier said than done. A randomly selected sample. Yeah. Now there are uh, different techniques of collecting a randomly selected sample. The most basic one is a simple random sample. You just, you have your population that you want to try to get a sample from and you just sample randomly. Okay. So that would be, so a simple random sample. Abbreviated SRS, which I do want you to make a note of because it'll come up in a lot of the questions that we do. So blah, 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 collected an SRS of 45 manatees. Right. So a simple random sample, just to tell you that, yeah, we can use the sample reliably. Right. And so a simple random sample is the most basic sample that we can collect. most basic sample we can collect. 
again, depending on your field, uh, you guys are all business, so unfortunately, I don't know how deep you go into it, but I'll leave that to you guys. Um, right, there can be tons and tons of different sampling techniques, uh, but they're kind of field specific. So some more sophisticated techniques would be um, left you on a cliffhanger. Uh, there are more sophisticated techniques. Things like a stratified random sample. A stratified random sample is so you split your population into strata, right? Different groups. Uh, most, the easiest one to think about would be regions, right? So think about BC and you split the regions, right? Each of those are strata, right? And then you sample randomly within each strata, right? That would be a stratified random sample. Yeah. You would, yeah. So usually you would uh, sample so it's proportional to the population, yeah. Uh, but we'll just mention it, that it's a thing. Yeah. Um, and then you could take it up, kick it up another notch and do multi-stage, right? So you split your strata into other strata, right? So you've split BC by region, and then inside each region, you want to make sure that you have a 50-50 split of males and females, for example. Right? Then you split each region into their own male-female strata. Right? You could go deeper, deeper, deeper. You can go by age group. Go by, I don't know, whatever area they live in in the strata. Okay? But so you can go to through lots of layers in multi-stage sampling. Oh, and what I wanted to say about uh, going back to the variables that we've talked about, we're only going as deep as categorical numerical, right? There are fields like psychology where they uh, break down their categorical variables to, there's like 20 different categorical variables. Right? And then there's lots of different numerical variables, but we'll just stay at the very highest level, right? But I don't want you to be as uh, scared if you come across some other variable names, right? Just be aware that that's what they're, and you can look them up, you're all capable. Okay? But we only need numerical, categorical. Yeah. Um, can you explain to us how would you randomly separate How would I do? First, I hop on a plane to Florida. <laughs> then I hit the beach. Um, and then, well, so yeah, so there's lots of different ways. So if you have the population, right, then you can assign a number. Easier to think, easier to think as students, right, at the college than manatees, because uh, then you'd have to think of them all lined up, waiting to be picked, right? Kind of cute. Um, but so then you can assign each of them a number, right? And then you can go to a random number generator and then whatever, however many you need, say you need 10 manatees, you pick the first 10 numbers in your randomly generated list, for example, like number 14, yeah, here, number 32, yeah, here, great. So they're all in my sample. That's one way to do it. Probably the most common way to do it. Um, a quick and dirty way would be if I had my population in this room, right? Then I could flip a coin, for example. Heads, you're in. Tails, you're out. In my sample. Tails, you're not in my sample. Right. Um, even drawing names out of a hat would be random. Right. So there's lots of different ways that you can pick a random sample. A really good question. 
thinking about manatees. Oh boy, how would I select them? I'd probably split the strata by species to make sure I have a proportional amount of species, maybe. I'll look into it. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm on it. Okay, any other questions? Nice. Cool. So, uh, so far, right, we've talked about observational studies, right? So for data collection, surveys, that kind of thing, we just go out and we observe information, right? Observing as in we ask someone or we look at this manatee and we weigh it and we measure it. We record the species, we record the gender, right? These are all observational studies. Oh, there. Um, Okay. There's two ways that we can collect data, right? Observational studies, they're kind of the most common, or experiments. Right. We've all kind of done experiments in, I think, elementary school or high school or whatever. We've all kind of done fake experiments, right? Uh, but that's another way that we can collect data. And so there are... two ways of collecting data. First one, through observational studies. Things like surveys, sampling manatees, user data, if you have a website and you have user data that you're looking at, right? all those things, you're just observing what's going on. So surveys, sampling manatees, user data and so on and so forth. The second being experimental studies. Okay. Leading me to section 1.5, which is on experiments. Again, experimental design is its own field, right? So it's its own huge thing, right? There's lots of ways that you can design an experiment depending on what it is you're experimenting with and that kind of thing. Um, but an experiment, right, is where you are controlling all the factors Right, so all the factors that have an impact on your response variable, right? We do experiments because we have a research question. If we have a research question, we have a response variable, right? It's whatever we're interested in. Okay. And so in an experiment, we control all the factors that might have an effect affect effect i went with a but i'm not really sure yeah i shouldn't even have asked <laughs> so, uh, control all the factors that might have an effect on the response variable. Because you're controlling the whole environment, 
right? You're controlling everything that has to do with the response variable, right? Uh, think about maybe tomato plants. You're, you want to look at the height of a tomato plant after a week of growing, that kind of thing. I don't know, probably like this, okay? And so that means you have to control the sunlight, you have to control the fertilizer, you have to control the soil, you have to control the amount of water, you have to control uh, temperature. All of these factors have to be controlled right, in an experiment. Okay? And so if you're able to control all these things though, there's a reward at the end, right? because that reward would be to be able to say that a change in this causes a change in the other thing, right? So an experiment is the only way to establish that causal relationship. Whereas if we're just looking at observational studies, right, we might observe that um, taller people tend to weigh more, right? There's a relationship there, just height. We all kind of know this. Right, and so there's a relationship, but we can't say that there's this causal relationship, right? All on board? Right, so um, experiments are the only way to establish a causal relationship between two factors. Oops. I'll just mention it again, assuming you control everything in the environment. Assuming you control everything in the environment. So again, experimental design and experiments are not something that we'll spend time on. I really can't see in business how you might do experiments. So it's not really that important. Okay. So, uh, but any questions before we move on? Okay. As promised, we'll start 1.6 today even though it looks like my decoy chart here. We weren't supposed to start it until uh, next Wednesday, but 1.6, don't worry, 1.6 usually takes me two days to get through. <sighs> yeah. On the plus side, less terminology, more doing. So anyways. 1.6 is on examining numerical data. So like I said, we'll look at numerical data and then we'll do the same thing for categorical data. And that's just kind of how we'll bounce through the course. Okay. So, so far on our journey, right, we've talked about, okay, well, how do we talk about a data set? And we talked about how do we collect data, right? Some different ways to collect data. And then now we have a data set in theory. Right? And so now we need to know now what, right? We want to know what's going on in our data set. And usually we do this kind of just quickly looking at our data. And so once we have Once we have a data set, we will want to examine 
our variables to get an idea of what they look like. Put quotes around look like, right? Idea of what they look like. Of course, if you've got a kind of a manageable data set, then just having it in Excel and kind of scrolling through, that's fine. But if you're dealing with uh, millions of data points, it gets a little tedious and you really can't gather anything, right? And so that's where the graphs come in, right? So we visualize these data or these variables, right? What's going on? what's a reasonable number that we're expecting to see? Do we have any extreme values in there? Right? What's going on? And so we use data visualization, right? or data viz as we call it in the viz. So data visualization We've got the usual suspects, right? bar graphs, pie charts, and the um, kind of strangely popular donut chart. It's a pie chart with a hole in the middle. Uh, anyways, I'm not in love with the pie chart. I'll tell you why, but, um, but those are kind of the usual suspects for numerical data. Uh, spoiler alert, we use a histogram. And I'll show you what I mean. Okay. Uh, but in general, it's it's just to provide so provides a clear, concise summary of your data. So we can just have a look at some quick examples here. Because uh, data visualization is actually kind of booming right now. Here's what the good folks at Facebook gave us. So there's all these kind of fun things that you can do. We can look at this and it's pretty obvious what's going on here. Well, if my projector would project better, it's got all these little lines. So each line is a Facebook connection and where there's lots of connections, just kind of gets brighter and brighter and brighter, right? So this is a data visualization. It's a really good one, right? And so um, there's lots of fun new things that we can do um, in data visualization that we, haven't really been able to do in the past. It's another one that I like to show this one. Here's kind of an example of what not to do. Although it's easy to go down this rabbit hole. Kind of da 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 da. Oh, whatever. There's some overlap. <laughs> So, and I love the caption that came with it. I didn't think of this, not that often. But so it's exciting, it's beautiful, it's technical. But what does it mean? All right, so you've got all these bubbles and they're all stemming from this one bubble. And I've got questions. I don't know about you guys. What do the colors mean? What do the size of the bubbles mean? What are these lines? Do they mean anything? Do the levels of the bubbles, right? The distance of the bubbles, does that mean anything? Or is it just kind of arbitrary? We've got questions, right? So although beautiful, it's not a very good data visualization, right? Because for a good data visualization, we should just be able to look at it and say, oh, I see what's going on here, right? And so that's one thing to keep in mind for if you're writing reports and stuff like that, because it is easy to get caught up in 
something like this. Right? But it's better to just keep it simple, nice, clear, concise. Okay. Well, I guess that's as good a place as I need to stop. <laughs> See you guys on Monday? Weird. Have a good weekend. Uh, I guess no labs this week.